All right, let's talk money now because that is probably what most of you guys are here for because that is what I end all of my episodes in, right? The world can be entirely f***ed and I will still tell you how it's f***ed from the money perspective, right? Unless I can give it to you from like a security perspective, but let's talk about that. So I'm going to bring it full circle now. The very first definition that I gave in this episode was GMO. GMO, genetically modified, right? Somebody is slicing and dicing DNA. Well, it cost roughly $136 million to develop a GMO plant. Development of more resilient, high yield, genetically modified crops is being fast tracked around the globe. So the genetically modified corn and soybean and whatever else, it took them almost $136 million to create that plant. You know how many genes Monsanto puts into GMO canola? So these genetically modified plants are not necessarily modified by using like man-made things, right? Sometimes in the GMO plant, there are good things. Like there is a bacteria, it's called BT, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jack this up right now, but I'm gonna try to say it. Bacillus, Bacillus, it's Bacillus, I think. Bacillus thuringiensis. Ooh, that's not how you say it. <laughs> Bacillus thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis, I don't know, it, it's BT for short, so um, yeah, we'll just, you know, Bravo Tango, it's BT for short, so we'll just call, we'll, I'm just gonna call it Bravo Tango, because um, yeah, I don't think I said that right, but anyway, so again, $136 million to create this genetically modified plant, they're taking things like this, you know, Bravo Tango stuff, this BT stuff, and they're, you know, adding it to the corn DNA, for example, and BT is a natural bacteria that it's used as a pesticide in organic farming, which we'll talk about also, but they're not just like taking, you know, putting things together. It's not like a Frankenstein corn. There is a purpose behind it. But with that being said and giving as much credit as I possibly can to the genetic engineers, companies like Bayer and Corteva account for 72% of planted corn and 66% of planted soybean across the United States. So out of the 90 acres that we have, my 90 million acres of corn, 65-ish acres straight up owned by Bayer and Cortiva. They're the ones who own the seeds. And if you didn't watch my glyphosate episode, I'm going to go through this really quickly, but you can, you can get the deep dive in that episode. So genetically modified plants are the intellectual property of the company that makes them, right? Which makes sense. If Bayer is spending $136 million to make this corn that doesn't die from all the other pests and, you know, insects and things like that that are trying to kill it. So farmers are going to want that, right? Think about it. If your livelihood depends on the amount of corn you can grow on your farm, aren't you going to want to set yourself up for success? Aren't you going to want to make sure that your output is as efficient and as capable as possible? That's all these farmers are doing, right? They were like, listen, I don't want to have to spend millions of dollars on herbicides and insecticides and fungicides when I can just go straight up and buy this GMO plant that doesn't fucking die. And if it does die, it's for reasons that just couldn't have been avoided. So the companies who create these GMOs, they own the rights to those seeds. So I want to get into a little bit about how that came from, right? It's called plant variety protection is what we're talking about. When I say that the Bayer and Corteva own these seeds, it's because they own the patents for the GMOs. So in 1930, there was something called the Plant Patent Act. Yes. And if you were wondering, like, the bitch just say 1930? Yes. This has not, this is not new, right? Um, it's become kind of, it's become more popular because of a lot of the lawsuits, which again, I talked about in the glyphosate episode. Of Canada. A David and Goliath legal battle over the ownership of genetically Monsanto, modified seeds. The corporation behind dozens of lawsuits. An analysis that we did of his crop, he must have known. The Plant Patent Act allowed for licensed plants to be sexually produced as long as they aren't sold. So for example, if Farmer Joe, we'll call him Farmer Joey, Say Farmer Joey created a tomato plant that is just 
sweet, it's large, and for some reason, tomato hornworms are not attracted to it, right? If you don't, if you don't know what a tomato hornworm is, they're like the larva of like this type of moth, and they're a bitch. I grow tomatoes, and these hornworms are such a pain in the ass. I can't imagine. I only have like a handful of tomato plants. I can't imagine having like hundreds of acres and having to deal with a tomato hornworm. But here's Joey, Farmer Joe. He created a tomato plant that hornworms seem to not like. Well, he can sell that plant, and I can buy that plant, but I can't sell that plant again, right? I can buy the plant. I can have it cross-pollinate with another, you know, some of my other plants. I can save the seeds and regrow them. I just can't sell Joey's tomato plant because Joey owns the rights to the plant itself. And that was going well for a while. But what happened was farmers would often save a portion of the harvest as, you know, for, you know, save a portion of the harvest and take the seeds from those things. So instead of having to go back to Joey and buy more seeds, I'm growing the fucking tomato. I just save the seeds and plant them again, right, for the next season. Well, sometimes farmers and sometimes even seed companies would do something called bin run. They're called bin run seeds, which means that they take not tomatoes in this case, but grain from their own crops. They would harvest it, clean it for impurities, maybe treat it, and then sell it to their farmer friends or just, you know, resell it. So there was no incentive for any company to try and create a better seed, a better plant, because they were just, the farmers were just going to grow, you know, plant the seed, grow the plant, save the seed, and then, you know, never need to buy from the seed company or from the company again or from the, you know, big corporation again. So corporations like, well, if I'm going to sell them the seeds once, you know, once every four years, because, you know, every now and then the farmers would come back and buy another batch of seeds just to make sure that, you know, just to reestablish purity and quality. So they're like, what the fuck? Am, why, why would I spend $136 million to create this awesome plant when Farmer Joey is only going to buy from me once every like three, four years or once every three, four season? It's just not worth it. They would, there would be no return on their investment if we're going to really get into the business of it. It was a very low ROI. It was not worth it for them. That was until the 1970s. So pretty much from 1930 to 1970, the plant world was kind of what it is. Someone creates a plant, cool, right? But they had no control over the plant that they created. That was until the 1970s when the Plant Variety Protection Act came out. This basically gave corporations control and the rights over every single piece of that plant. So if I wanted to buy one of their seeds, and I, if I plant the plant, I cannot save the seeds from the plant that I grew. Why? Because for one, the seed that I planted belongs, the, the rights to the seed belongs to the company. And this Plant Variety Protection Act now also gives them the rights to all of the seeds produced for generations to come. And here's the best part. You don't just go to the store and buy these seeds. You go to Bayer, you go to Corteva, and you sign a contract. And the contract tells you what you can and cannot do. And for Bayer, and I don't know about Corteva, but I would imagine it's the same. I know for sure for Bayer that in that contract, they tell you you cannot save the seeds. So if you want to grow that plant next year, you have to come back and buy from us. And up until then, farmers were just saving the seeds and you know, producing them again the following year, which was saving them a ton of money. But now Bayer's like, nah, we own those seeds. If we catch you, if we catch you saving seeds and replanting them, or if we catch you saving seeds and selling them, we're taking your ass to court. You needed cash to buy more land, and reselling GMO seeds was your only option. And there will be no mercy. <laughs> there was a movie about this that came out, I think it was like 2007, 2007, 2009, something like that where Monsanto, which was just recently bought out by Bayer, sued this guy in Canada um, because he was doing that. And it was like, Monsanto will continue with its case tomorrow, focusing on the investigation that led to the discovery of the genetically modified canola. It really ripped off the freaking facade that we had as it came to the agricultural industry. And again, that was in Canada. This is not something that's specific to the United States. These companies operate internationally. 